Let's read our text together this morning. The passage that we'll look at uh, to help us with this, or I think gives particular insight into the agenda of this movement, which is really what we're talking about this morning, is Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. So if you'll turn there, I'll read that passage for us, and then we'll pray to the Lord for help. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. We're here for beginning of Pastor Rick's session. Uh, I have no PowerPoint slides. I don't have a bow tie. I have nothing going for me right now. So I'm starting with both feet in a hole, so you're going to have to bear with me through this session. Uh, I don't have much of a creative side with those nice uh, sl- I really like those slides. I'm going to have to take some good discipleship from our brother and, and work on that. The title of our session, The Militancy of the Movement. What is the war really for? And our text that we'll get to as we walk through this is Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. And so let's read that together, and then let's uh, pray. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. And the Bible says, Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes, who say, let him be quick, let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this time together. Uh, it just, Lord, what a glorious blessing to be with your people and to learn from one another, God, to learn from your word, uh, to worship you and to thank you and to praise you, Lord, and to think about ways, Lord, that we can serve you in the context in which we find ourselves in this culture that is just increasing in their brazenness against your word and increasing in their and the boldness with which they sin. Uh, we see this, Lord, as fundamentally attack on the veracity of your word, the truth of your word. And so, Lord, it gives us uh, great joy to learn that we may be faithful to you and uh, contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, but at the same time, Lord, it can be a sobering, uh, eye-opening understanding of the, this world in which we are sojourners and pilgrims and the wickedness of it. And so I pray, God, I pray that you would bless the work of your people uh, to serve you with the gospel, to see homosexuals saved. I pray, Lord, that you would glorify yourself and the efforts of your people to understand this, understand your word, to uh, engage, Lord, our culture, our, our society in the way that we should as the pillar and ground of the truth. And Lord, that you'd be glorified in saving some, Lord, for your namesake. We love you. We thank you for this time together. Thank you for the church. Thank you for your people. I pray that you'd bless uh, this session as we talk through uh, the mechanics of this movement, Lord, where it's headed and what we see and how we can stand faithfully for you against it. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. So the militancy of the movement. You know, what's the war really for? And in this session, what we want to do is take some time and Go through some details, if you will. We've got to unpack what's going on. I know for me, when I first started studying this, uh, there was a lot of bells and whistles going off, light bulbs going off, just not really understanding what was behind all of this. And the more that you unpack it, the more that you peel back the layers of the onion, uh, the more that you see, and the more that we can understand biblically what's happening so that we as the people of God, one, aren't discouraged. You know, we can see everything around us just headed south And it can be a cause for despair in the heart of the Christian or a discouragement. Our God is sovereign, amen? Our God is in control. And though it may look like everything around us is out of control and in chaos, we know that God is sovereign. And our joy is in him. Our hope is in him. Uh, We understand from scripture what's going on. And it just, uh, this is an opportunity with respect to this movement and these issues uh, to come to grips with that, with what's going on. And to see that in scripture often is very helpful. You know, I remember when I first came to this church out of easy believism, where the word of God really wasn't taught, you know, where the gospel really wasn't preached. All you heard was ask Jesus into your heart. And there are a bunch of, uh, you know, lost people in the congregation with you. Um, 
scripture didn't really apply. I didn't see it lived out in front of my eyes. But you come to a biblical church where the gospel's being preached and when you've got genuine brother and sister, brothers and sisters who love the Lord and live for the Lord, then scripture just seems to come alive to you, right? You see scripture being lived out in front of you. In a similar sense, we can take a look at the world around us. You know, if, if you've witnessed anybody who is a, uh, uh, one of those sort of, we view them sometimes a little kooky, a futurist that in everything that's going on, everything points to end times and everything that's happening right now is pointing to these, you know, the planets that are going to align at a certain amount of time and then Jesus is going to come back. So they've already bought their white robe and they're going to go sit out on the hill and wait for that, you know. <laughs> they look at everything that's going on in our culture or in the news and they look at what scripture says and they're putting two and two together well you know for the christian we do that Uh, we look at what happens we look at the the wickedness around us even and in it all we see the eternal decrees and plans of god at work uh, being fulfilled and so this is nothing that catches god by surprise right this is nothing that should be um, in that sense a cause for despair or a cause for discouragement our god reigns And so this is just an opportunity now for us to unpack this movement a little bit, unpack what's happening, and then look at one particular example here of what Scripture has to say about it. So with this session, the militancy of the movement, we want to take a look at the agenda that is supported, that is pressed forward by homosexual community. The homosexual community likes to deny the existence of any agenda at all likes to deny that there is an agenda. There's simply no question for us as we look at what's happening in the news, what we see on the media, that there is a movement to push forward a radical and pervasive homosexual agenda. For years, even today, they try to deny that fact. There is no agenda. Just let us live the way we want to live, right? We just want to live in the privacy of our own homes and do what we want to do, and we just want to live our lives. There is an agenda. The Rainbow Alliance says this, the gay agenda, and this is coming from a a homosexual organization who also at one point says that using the word agenda is not a good thing. They say the gay agenda is but one of the many lies promulgated by radical religious political activists. So if you claim there is an agenda to all this or an agenda on the part of the homosexual movement, you are a radical religious political activist. You're a freak, (laughs) all right? GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, in its list of offensive terms says, an offensive term is, quote unquote, gay agenda or homosexual agenda. The preferred terms that the movement would like you to use are lesbian and gay civil rights movement or lesbian gay movement. You can understand, right, why that's the case. Also offensive was the term itself, homosexual because homosexual is a clinical term and dehumanizes the person. So they don't like the word homosexual. They certainly don't like the word sodomite. They prefer the word gay. We can understand why that is as well. Others have called the notion of a homosexual agenda the bedrock of our bigotry. So if we say that there's an agenda, we purport that they're trying to accomplish something, that's just the foundation of our bigotry against them. There's some secretive agenda that they're out to accomplish. The purpose of this term, they say, is to portray as sinister the lesbian and gay civil rights movement. We're painting them as sinister. According to a writer for the Human Rights Campaign, and listen to the way that that's worded. The name of the organization is Human Rights Campaign. What's a campaign? It's an agenda. It's, It's a movement. The human right, and human rights, right? We're talking about human rights. This is not homosexual rights, These are civil rights. These are human rights. See the way that it's packaged? We can't be ignorant of Satan's devices, right? Satan's schemes. Human Rights Campaign is an LGBT organization, and they say, we're not looking for this fight. There is no gay agenda. All our community, we call it a community, all our community was doing was working, paying taxes, trying to live our lives. That's all they're doing, right? That's all they're doing right now, just trying to pay their taxes, just working, trying to live their lives. Again, that word community itself points to an agenda. Human rights campaign points to an agenda, points to a movement. All you need to do to start a movement is to have a cause. When a group of people have a cause 
and then they form community together around that cause, the agenda is formed when the loudest voices associated with that cause, associated with that movement, begin to speak. And the loudest voices, the most influential voices, by de default, provide the agenda. Now, it's not necessary that everyone in that agenda agree with the agenda. Everyone in the community, you're not going to find, you know, unequivocal agreement on every issue. But loud voices, influential voices in the community, in the cause, in the movement, are going to provide for the agenda of the movement. That being said, the homosexual agenda today is alive and thriving and aggressive and pervasive. And it's absurd to even attempt statements like there is no agenda, right? It's just ridiculous. We see right through that. You know, published in fall of 2000 in the Journal of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, Tony Payne said this. This is in the year 2000. So fast forward 15 years and you can see the difference here. But listen to what Tony says. Within the span of a generation, our society seems to have moved from suspicion and condemnation through grudging tolerance to now open acceptance and promotion. And now it seems to have gone all the way to suspicion and condemnation of those who might speak ill of homosexuality. And in that, we can see the progress, right, of the movement. In that, woven between those lines, is the agenda that we're talking about, the homosexual agenda. You'd literally have to, in our day to day, you literally have to have your head in the sand not to pick up on this. We see it in the news. We see it in the media. We see it on TV. We see it in the movies. We read it in our books. We see it in elementary school curriculums, right? We see it all over the place. Um, this movement, this agenda is advancing, and it's advancing at an alarming rate. Those words were written in fall of 2000. I wonder what Tony would say today. There's much, much, much that has taken place over the last even 10 years, last eight years, six years of the president that we have. According to the Human Rights Campaign, again, uh, the way that it's labeled, this is just one organization. And listen to their victories that they've accomplished for the agenda. Listen, they claim victories online, very aggressive, various aspects of their obvious agenda. They challenged DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, and Prop eight in California in the courts, and they won those fights. You remember what Prop 8 is, was, uh, was in California? Proposition 8 uh, was the, 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 the civil work in California to define marriage as the union between one man and one woman in California. So it was a, a marriage amendment to the state constitution to keep that as the definition of marriage, one man, one woman. woman. And human rights campaign was leading the way in having Prop 8 and DOMA defeated in the courts. Led the fight for same-sex marriage in multiple states. And as we've seen, they are winning. The courts routinely are casting down marriage defense amendments or marriage defense acts. Related to the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, it says here that HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, invested $2 million in a 12-week campaign that resulted in a successful vote putting the Employment Non-Discrimination Act in place. This victory, they said, was years in the making. For two decades, HRC's deep bench of policy experts and advocates have walked the halls of Congress engaging with lawmakers in both parties about the importance of the ENDA Act, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. If you're familiar with that act, it is pervasive again with infiltrating companies, business, even private companies, corporations with a homosexual agenda to provide for what we'll talk about within the workplace. We'll get there. Passage of the 2009 Hate Crimes Prevention Act into federal law. Hate, hate Crimes Prevention is now a part of federal law. That's going to have deep implications for Christians, deep implications for our rights to share and preach the gospel. We'll also talk about that. HRC led the repeal of the military's Don't Ask, Don't Tell law. They were the ones who led that. They donated $7 million to election efforts in 2008. They donated $20 million to election efforts in 2012. And now they run on an annual budget of $50 million or more. They began efforts, listen to this, to protect our youth, they say, in public schools. They have a welcoming schools program where each year in the public schools it will allow them to come in, and many do, 
They provide a welcoming atmosphere to those students, elementary K through 12, who are of the LGBT community. They have a call it out campaign in the schools that they run nationwide, which is a campaign against homophobia for students to call out homophobia wherever they see it in the classrooms and the administrators and those that run the school. They've provided for youth studies on, quote, growing up LGBT in America. They provide materials for the schools with respect to the LGBT community. They support a national, in the schools, they support a national coming out day for students, K through 12, for students to come out LGBT. They host, across the nation, what they call Time to Thrive conferences. The goal of the Time to Thrive conference is creating a thriving lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender student community. A, a thriving, they say, LGBT youth population. They want to cultivate it. They want to cultivate it in the schools, and they want to begin cultivating it in our elementary schools. Now, furthermore, with respect to school reforms, they call them, quote-unquote, the homosexual lobby all over the country has successfully argued against what is called reparative therapy or orientation therapy, orientation change, and they have taken away the rights of counselors to implement it. Many states now have outlawed the use of any reparative therapy. Now, what that is, basically, is you have, let's say you have little Johnny, little Susie, who at age nine comes to you and says, I'm struggling you know, I've heard about this. Maybe I am supposed to be a little boy and I'm a little girl. Maybe I'm a little girl. I should be a little boy. The laws now in many states prohibit the ability of a counselor, any counselor in the state, to work with that student to get them to be comfortable with their own gender, the gender that was given them. They've outlawed the ability of those counselors to talk to them and counsel them against exploring that and just embracing the gender that they are. It's called reparative therapy. It goes farther than that, but you can read up on that for yourself. Uh, it is, it's a despicable law. It's a despicable direction that's headed that we can't even talk to our students, our young people about that in the public schools or in counseling rooms all over this country. Homosexual lobby um, in Minnesota recently passed a policy for high school sports. I know you've probably heard about some of this, Inclo including in that all extracurricular, extracurricular um, programs like band and chorus. In most states, band, chorus, the arts, drama, all included in a high school, what they call a high school sports association. So Minnesota recently passed a policy, already a done deal, that together with public schools they, and private schools, religious schools, homeschool umbrella programs that use public school sports programs for activities for their kids. The policy grants transgender students the right to play on either boys' teams or girls' teams at their own choice, stipulating no sex, no gender on the field, no gender in the locker room, no gender in the field house, no gender in the school, no gender in the hotel rooms, already passed, no gender in bathrooms, just removing the gender identi identity of students, allowing them to choose girl sports or boy sports, whatever they're going to participate in. Several women's only colleges. This is interesting. Several, women, several women's only colleges in the Northeast. I've been in the news recently. If you've seen any of that. Uh, one in particular showing up in October 2014 in an article in the New York Times entitled, When Women Become Men at Wellesley. And that's dealing with the issue of transgender students. One of those articles in the New York Times explained the issue of men coming to the school identifying themselves as women. Who then, <laughs> this is another wrinkle, is the way that the, the perversion goes, right? We talked about this, that wickedness, evil doesn't stagnate. It doesn't sit still. It progresses. It has a, an advancement. It will continue. Here, it's another example of that. In one particular college in the Northeast, they're having a problem with their more than two dozen students that identify themselves as transgender, where men, believing themselves to be transgendered females, attend the women's only college and then come out as lesbians. Follow the, I mean, I could write it down, right, and follow the progression to keep it straight in my mind. Men who believe themselves to be transgendered females, women trapped in a man's body, who go to a, woman's, a women's only school and then come out as lesbians. 
So you can imagine if you have your daughter in that school with the dorm showers or the bathrooms or even the classes. There's a story that, uh, told by Michael Brown in his book entitled A Queer Thing Happened to America about Professor Jacob Hale of Cal State Northridge. Now, Professor Jacob Hale is involved in the transgender community. This is, listen, this are not, these are not abnormal. Uh, this is going on right now as we speak and it's becoming more and more pervasive. Jacob Hale, involved with the transgender community, he enjoys doing drag as Miss Angelica and hanging out with quote unquote gender queer sex radical friends. And he used to be a woman. So Jacob Hale used to be a woman, comes out now as a man, transgender man, is a transgender man who likes to do drag as a woman and then likes to hang out with genderqueer sex radical friends. Genderqueer is a term for anything goes, right? Really not homosexual male, really not lesbian, really not only transgender, it's anything goes. He used to be a woman. A woman who became a man who enjoys drag as a woman and then sexual intimacy with both. Really can't call it intimacy, it's just sex with both. I think we can use that term in our context here. These people and many in the medical psychology fields have made gender or physiology the problem. What's the problem? The sin, the heart, a heart of depraved man out from which that heart flows, that which defiles the sin. It has nothing to do with gender and physiology, but that's the way that our world today looks at it. It's a gender problem. It's a physiology problem. You're, you have male plumbing, but you're not male internally, and something has to be done about that. But again, no need to be concerned. No need to be alarmed. There is no homosexual agenda, right? There's no, there's no homosexual agenda. There's no active lobby pushing for the rights regarding this nonsense. The agenda, what we see, is alive and kicking. It is, again, it's aggressive, it's pervasive, and we shouldn't be surprised. These are all just schemes. They are devices of the enemy. We need to be aware of them and know how, uh, from the basis of biblical truth uh, from the church, we need to know how to respond. So, number one. There is a homosexual movement to push forward a radical and pervasive agenda. There is a movement, there is an agenda, and they are out to accomplish their ends. So what is the homosexual agenda, and what is the movement trying to accomplish? What's the war really for? What are they out to get? Now, we can look at the media, we can look at the news, we can see various aspects, right? The whatever comes under the umbrella of equal rights, whatever that means, a marriage, you know, heterosexuals can marry, why can't we? Why are you denying us marriage rights? Those kinds of things. We can see the details in play, but what are they ultimately out to get to? Despite the denials of homosexuals, Anyone can clearly see that most homosexual organizations fundamentally agree on common goals, and there are several of them. A clear majority of those who claim to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, all support those goals. They're pretty common goals. Most sodomites would approve of those goals. There is a clear lobbying on the part of that agenda, that movement, to lobby government. They've successfully done so, to lobby media, to lobby the schools and nationwide academic or school programs, school support organizations. And there are clear plans, clear directives. There's a clear grassroots organizational effort for that work to be well-funded and for it to continue. Now that's happening right now. They have increasingly won the funding and the support to continue doing what they're doing. The message is very clear and the message is consistent. The demands made are clear. The demands made are consistent. And those in, uh, that includes those who claim to be Christians, and to our brother's uh, point yesterday, which is really, really good, uh, compromising false churches, and those that have compromised in the church call themselves gay Christians, false converts. There's a fundamental harmony among all these groups, the way that the Human Rights Campaign calls it a community. They're a community together. There is an agenda. There is a movement. So what's the, the main objective of the movement? Now what they would say, the objective of the movement, the objective of their community is just, we want to live our lives and be left alone. That's what you would hear them say. We just want to live our lives. We want to be left alone. That's deception. Many of them don't understand that deception. They themselves are deceived and they are deceiving others, deceived and deceiving others. But that's what they would say. Just, we want to live our lives. We want to be left alone. They would call it societal change. In fact, the human rights campaign said that they want to change America right? Change society. They're out to do that. They would call it societal change or civil rights. Well, this is all a deception. 
Despite the many different issues that the homosexual agenda is fighting for, they all fundamentally line up under one primary objective. All of this is a symptom or pointing to that primary objective. What is that? The full approval and even acclaim for homosexuality as a perfectly normal and legitimate equal to heterosexuality. Not simply in their eyes, but in everyone's eyes. That the sinful lifestyle, the behavior, the conduct, the philosophies, the thinking of homosexuality to be fully approved of, fully condoned, fully accepted as normal, not only as normal, but that which is worthy of admiration on the part of that movement and everyone else who looks at it. Approval and acclaim for their lifestyle, their sin, their conduct as perfectly normal. They want to justify their sin. They want to justify their sin in their eyes. They want to justify their sin in the eyes of God. They want to justify their, their sin in the eyes of everyone else. They want to legitimize their actions. And they want everyone else to approve and applaud that as right and good. One of the reasons that you should applaud it or that you should acclaim it is because it's difficult, they say, to be homosexual, sodomite today, in our context that there's been so much prejudice, so much discrimination. And so it's hard to be a homosexual. That's why the movement is worthy of acclaim, worthy of applause, so to speak. However, all of that, if that's their agenda, if their agenda is to get approval, to, for everyone else to condone their sin, to approve of their lifestyle, it present, presents a significant problem. Homosexuality has long been held for centuries long been held to be immoral by others. It's long held to be immoral. Their sin was in direct conflict with so-called societal ethics or societal morality. We all know that to be flowing out from uh, ultimate authority, ultimate morality, which comes from God alone. So if you want to move beyond homosexuality, if you want to move homosexuality beyond mere tolerance, beyond mere acceptance to approval you have to justify to yourself that it is right and good. And in the process of justifying yourself that it's right and good, you have to convince others that it's right and good. The way that you, one, justify yourself that it's right and good, and then convince someone else that it's right and good, is to demonize the opposition as evil. It's not enough to say that I believe that homosexuality is a right and it's okay and we can just go along to get along. It's not enough for that. There's another equal and opposing force at odds against them. So in order for my behavior, if, that's, if I'm a part of that movement, in order for my behavior to be condoned or accepted or applauded or fully approved of, I not only have to convince myself and others that it's right and good, I have to convince others that the, the opposition is evil. It is to call evil good and then to go the next step to call good evil. It's so what they have to do in order to accomplish their agenda. Justify, justify myself and then oppose those or demonize those that oppose me. They have to call good evil, evil good and good evil. What God condemns, they affirm. What God punishes, they exalt. And those that stand for good, those that stand for righteousness, must be condemned and punished. One commentator said this, listen to this. Where at one time homosexuality was considered a pathological disorder... Now those who oppose it will be deemed homophobic and suffering themselves from a pathological disorder. Where at one time homosexual conduct was considered morally wrong, now criticism of homosexuality will be considered morally wrong. Do you see the agenda at work? It's pretty obvious, right? This is clearly what's going on. You can't mistake it. You can't miss it. To legitimize the one, you must delegitimize the other. In her book entitled The Criminalization of Christianity, Janet Folger describes it this way. First, gay activists come out of the closet. Second, having come out of the closet, they demand their rights. Third, they demanded that everyone else recognize their rights. Fourth, by default, they strip away the rights of those who oppose them. Do you see that happening today? Yep. Fifth, they want to put those who oppose their rights into the closet. That's the way that this works. Right? You can see that map laid out. Now, whether someone said, well, there's, an, there's no agenda or there is an agenda, that agenda is at work. Now, you can see that happening before our very eyes. This is calling evil good and then going the next step to call good evil. 
The very centerpiece of this agenda is the view that the homosexual movement is a civil rights movement. I don't know if you guys have heard this or not, uh, but this is this has come out. I mean, I have to take it for what it's worth. It, the gay is the new black. Have you heard that? <laughs> the audacity and ridiculousness of that statement is telling, right? That speaks volume. For a long time now, uh, many in the movement would say that gay is the new black. Just stop to think about that for a moment and all that that entails. And it is an absurd statement. Why in this country do we have laws that protect the rights of blacks, Hispanics, women, children, and the elderly against discrimination? Why do we have laws that protect them against discrimination? It's because we as a nation believe that it is morally wrong to discriminate against them. There are laws protecting those from discrimination because we think it's morally wrong, and that's based on the word of God, right? Morally wrong to discriminate against them. So we have civil laws that protect against that discrimination. The absurd claim and the immoral claim of the homosexual agenda is that the homosexual lifestyle is just as morally innocent as being black or Hispanic or a woman or elderly or a child. That it is just as morally innocent as being one of those. All people are made in the image of God, as our brother said this morning. All people are made in the image of God, and homosexuality is a violation against the image of God. It's only the defiantly blind that cannot see that. God deals with man according to his conduct. We've said that in several places in Scripture. Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. The books were opened. God judged each one according to his, his works, judged according to our conduct. That's the way that God deals with us, us with respect to our sin. We're judged according to our works, whether good or evil. And here, the homosexual community would have you believe that this is somehow a civil rights issue. The passage of laws, then, that protect perversion, when we pass laws that protect perversion, they are not only immoral, but because they violate an objective morality, what we have is morality based on God's word, and they end up then violating the rights of others. You think about the way this whole thing works, and you look at the departure from that in their agenda, we have laws in our country to protect against perversion, protect against corruption, and that perversion, that corruption offending the rights of others. Passage of laws then that protect perversion, protect corruption, are immoral because not only then do they protect that perversion, protect that corruption, but by default they protect the offense against the rights of others. There's no other way that it can work. In our country, there's no other way that this thing can go. When we depart God's basis for morality, when we depart, let's just put it to a, a basic thought process. When we depart objective morality and we start making up as we go along for ourselves or doing what we think is right sort of in our own eyes, so to speak, then the result, the net result of that is that humanistic inconsistency that we've seen in the homosexual agenda. When one group's perverted or immoral rights are protected, another group's rights are going to be violated. They can't stop at calling evil good. They've got to press on to calling good evil. So what about a Christian baker who wants to honor God in his business by refusing to bake a cake for a same-sex marriage um, because it would violate their faith, their conscience to do so. Doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> we were listening to uh, Wretched Radio. A brother sent us a link to Wretched Radio podcast the other day where a man uh, was uh, going around town, I think it was in New York, uh, and he interviewed, called 13 different bakeries and asked for a cake in support of their pro-traditional marriage event they were having. And he wanted the words on the cake to say, gay marriage is wrong. So he calls up the bakery, uh, 13 different bakeries, wasn't one or two, right? 13 different bakeries, asked for this cake, and in every case got shot down. That's not in view of what we believe. 
Uh, we believe that that statement is wrong. There were some folks who were just overtly hostile and using multiple explicatives and yelling over the phone. I mean, that kind of thing. If you heard that podcast, um, okay for them to do, not okay for him to do. Right? It's a double, it produces a wicked double standard. If you depart God's morality, if you depart objective morality, that's what you get. Uh, not only is the movement not a civil rights movement, it becomes a violation of civil rights. You see that? It must move on to calling good evil. That's what happens when you abandon God's morality. When you abandon God's morality, insanity ensues, right? Evil ensues. Insanity in the courts ensue. We see a, a legislative environment today that is ridiculous. And the judgments of liberal, homosexual, sodomite activist judges who pronounce these verdicts in their courts, it's absurd. Worldly reasoning, their futile thinking, understanding in their hearts are darkened. There's no way to be practically consistent because we have abandoned our moral compass when this happens. The approval of homosexuality will mean the loss of religious liberty rights for all of us. And the persecution of Christians is coming. The prosecution of Christians is coming. God's law is so simple. You think about God's law, so simple. God's law is so simple that once it was hung in elementary school classrooms, right? You could go to any kindergarten class and see the Ten Commandments on the wall. So simple and yet so unimaginably wise, right? So unimaginably, so beautifully perfect. Just the omniscience of God. The, the wisdom of God in his law. It's staggering. It's one of the, the evidences that this book, God's law, is not written by man because of the genius, the brilliance of it. So amazingly pure. And in that perfect consistency, if you just follow God's law, hang on to God's law, cling to God's law, perfect consistently, consistency when God's law is applied. But many today in the homosexual agenda and otherwise, who may not have graduated the eighth grade, believe that they're smarter than God and believe that they can come up with laws that pertain to themselves and for themselves and are wise themselves to do that. And we get away from God's morality, God's laws, and insanity ensues. Think about it this way. We oppose gay rights because the homosexual lifestyle violates God's law. The objection to that statement is that we then impose our Christianity, our religion, our morality on others. So that, they say, violates the separation of church and state. We're not out to force people to go to church. We don't force them at the point of the sword. We don't threaten to blow up their businesses and send kids with bombs around their waist into crowded areas to kill people in order to convert them to our religion. However, all governments impose a morality on its people. All governments do this. All nations are built on the idea that there are objective moral laws that should govern society. Excuse me. That objective moral law is then put in place by the laws that we pass. If we have an objective morality, that morality is enforced on the people, so to speak, by the laws that we pass as a nation. You think about those laws, they're either going to be moral in connection to that objective morality or they're going to be immoral and disconnected from it. So we as a nation would say that murder is wrong. Murder is wrong. And yet now our country has passed laws making the murder of babies legal. Is that law moral or immoral? Immoral because it's it's, it has gotten separated from the objective morality that we should be basing all of our laws on, God's morality. That's where our, our laws have come from, by the way. Uh, the laws of a vast majority of the countries in the world, maybe North Korea excluded, are all based on an objective morality that has flowed from Christianity, that has flowed from God's law. And so when we make laws that separate themselves or we separate them from God's morality or objective morality, insanity ensues. And you have a country that since the time that law was introduced has aborted 50 to 60, 55 million babies, that law is immoral. That's a law our country passed. You go worldwide, it's now, the average is about 55 million babies aborted per year. Every 12 months in this world, 
about 55 million babies are aborted. You take the idea that someone who has cancer, suffering under pain, we have laws in this country against murder. And yet we pass a law then that in compassion for them, we can kill them, kill them legally and call it euthanasia. Now, is that law moral or immoral? It's immoral because it's separated from objective morality that is introduced to us by God. You have countries now and societies that can, even in our country, where the government can come in and seize your land. What command does that violate of the Ten Commandments? Command not to steal, right? And yet we have laws that will allow a government to go in and take your land. Is that law moral or immoral? More because it's separated from God's objective morality. So governments around the world base laws on objective morality. We contend that comes primarily from God. And even though there may be a separation of church and state, which as Baptists we uphold as necessary, there is no separation between God and state. And God is the morality, is given us the morality that we base our laws on. If you take away that moral objectivity, if you take away that objectivity, chaos ensues. Insanity ensues. In other words, we make it up as we go along. We do this as we want to, driven by passions and our own understanding of what rights, all those things, all that nonsense, insanity ensues. Sam Waldron says this, the choice is very simple. Will our civil laws in the USA be moral or immoral? They will be one or the other. The homosexual says that it is immoral for his rights to be taken away. We say that it is immoral for his lifestyle to be sanctioned and protected as normal and innocent by the state. It comes down to whose morality you want to govern our nation, the homosexual's morality or God's. And that's the choice that we see today. This is all headed because we have chosen the homosexual's morality as a basis on which we make civil laws in this country. This is all headed in a horrendously horrible, despicable direction. Did you know that the, the very same arguments that have been used to legalize and support the homosexual lifestyle in the courts, the very same arguments are being used for introducing legalization of pedophilia. You can just take out the word homosexual and put in the word pedophile and the arguments work exactly the same. But it goes beyond that. This is just another example of man rejecting, casting off the authority of God. The opportunity for many, not just homosexuals, to attack the word of God, to attack God's authority. Man outside of Christ will not submit to God, will not submit to his word. They hate God's word. They hate his idea of morality. They hate his authority. I will not have him to rule over me. And this is an opportunity for the homosexual certainly to do it, but then for everyone else to take up that just cause, right? Jump on the bandwagon and do the very same thing. Just cast off God's authority. The more support that they garner for themselves, the more rabid they become in lashing out at any appearance of that authority. You never notice that? Someone you may disagree with, and you may have a disagreement over whatever it is, whatever subject it is, but as soon as you bring up God or God's word, what the Bible says, that hostile, that opposition turns hostile. That opposition just becomes inflamed. So they want to cast off anything to do with God's authority or God's right as sovereign God to rule over them. That's why this movement is so militant. That's why this movement is so aggressive. The real issue is that they want everyone they want our government, our schools, our businesses, our laws, our organizations, our homes, our families, and our churches to approve of their sin. That's what it comes down to. To pronounce and believe that it is morally innocent and morally harmless. However, it doesn't stop there. They're going to say that evil is good. They've got to go the next step to saying that good is evil. And so they want to marginalize, delegitimize, oppose those who oppose them. They want to silence the voices of those that view their lifestyle as morally irreprehensible, morally harmful, morally destructive and cancerous to our society, our government, our schools, our laws, our organizations, our businesses, our homes, our families, and our churches. That's why the movement is so militant, so aggressive. That's what the war is ultimately for. If you boil it all down, it all comes down to that. 
So in, a, in promoting their sin as innocent and harmless, they can't simply work their agenda. They must delegitimize or marginalize or silence your voice against them. They must do both, call evil good and work to call good evil. Anyone who opposes homosexuality, homosexuality is viewed as hateful. To speak out against the movement is to spew hate. There is no in-between. You either fully embrace it or you hate it, right? And we as the church, we as Christians, the people of God, can do one of two things. We can either love them or we can affirm them. You get that? But we can't do both. You cannot affirm them in their sin, affirm them in their lifestyle, and love them at the same time. That is t patently unloving to do that. You can either love them by presenting them with the truth of God's word and lovingly and gently and humbly and patiently present God's word, God's truth to them, give them the gospel, they can be saved, which means standing against their sin. Bringing the word of God, the, the spotlight of God's word to bear on their sinful lifestyle, you can either lovingly do that and love them or you can affirm them in it. And we'll hear from Brother Mike uh, later today on churches that are affirming them. Affirming them. Many of you maybe remember uh, Prop 8 in California. It was being de debated in 2008. There were many that held up signs at that rally. Uh, Prop 8 equals hate. <laughs> there is no room for quote-unquote disagreement. There is no room for opposing views. It is either embrace it fully or hate it. It's an actual strategy spread by leading homosexual advocates, Marshall Kirk, Hunter Madsden. Uh, this strategy was to encourage the connection of what they called homo-hatred with Nazi abuses, with the Holocaust, with KKK and the like. And they put pictures to it and all. You can go online and see the pictures. If you don't embrace the movement, you're like a Nazi. You're like one of those that killed six million Jews in the Holocaust. You're one of those in the KKK who wants to drag out all homosexual, homosexuals and lynch them, hang them in the streets. It's ridiculous. Interesting, uh, Dr. Laura Schlesinger. You've heard Dr. Laura before on the radio. Radio personality, and Dr. Laura is Jewish. And Dr. Laura, Jewish, and not totally anti-homosexual, was widely labeled a Nazi because she expressed some differences with some goals of the homosexual agenda. A Jewish lady who was called a Nazi. If you don't agree with the movement, you're a Nazi, you're a Klansman, you're a backwoods, bigot, gay-bashing, hate-mongering, nutcase, homophobe. <laughs> there seems to be no in-between. They're talking about you. <laughs> They're talking about me. You're a homophobe. Interesting to see the definition of homophobia on many of their websites. I was on the PFLAG website, Parents, Family, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And on that website, Dr. Dorothy, Dorothy Riddle, a clinical psychologist, amazing that that industry, that study has been enormously infiltrated by sodomites. Um, seems to be virtually taken over. Dorothy Riddle, Dr. Dorothy Riddle, clinical psychologist for PFLAG, defines various stages of homophobia. Homophobia. This is, these are the stages. A homophobe first is going to be repulsed. If you're repulsed by homosexuality, you are a homophobe. You're homophobic. Repulsion is seen as, uh, where homosexuality is seen as unnatural, immoral, or sinful. Right? If you pity the homosexual movement, you're a homophobe. Pity is characterized as heterosexual chauvinism. Heterosexuality is preferred and those who are born that way, quote-unquote, should be pitied. That's being a homophobe. Homophobia is defined as tolerance. If you're tolerant of the homosexual movement, you're a homophobe. Tolerance is something to, homosexuality is defined as something to develop past. Gays are less mature than straights and should be treated with the same protectiveness and indulgence one uses with a child. I'm just tolerating you. Makes you a homophobe. You're a homophobe. You're a homophobe if you accept the homosexual movement. If you accept homosexuality, because homosexuality then is defined as something that still needs to be accepted. <laughs> if you have to accept it, you're a homophobe. Riddle says such statements like, what you do in bed is your own business, or, quote, you're not gay to me, you're a person, unquote, 
They deny social and legal realities. If you accept homo homosexuality, you're a homophobe. The very first positive level in all of this to get you from being a homophobe into the more glorified position of being a, a non-homophobe, you've been rescued from that terrible disease, the very first level of that, Dr. Riddle says, is support. In order to break out of being a homophobe and to be considered something other, you've got to support. Working to safeguard the rights of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender individuals, being aware, that the climate, being aware of the climate and the irrational unfairness that they face. So you, in order to be something other than a homophobe, you have to support it. The next level of escaping homophobia is, to, is admiration and appreciation. Besides, it's hard to be LGBT, and so it's worthy of, of approval, of admiration and appreciation. And the next level, if you want to escape homophobia, is nurturance. We've got to cultivate it. We've got to support it and grow a thriving LGBT community, right? Assumes that LGBT people are indispensable in our society, and they view these people who nurture it, these non-homophobes, they view the LGBT lifestyle with delight, and they are willing to advocate for them. So it, it, you can hang it up. I mean, there's, there's no, we're all homophobes. <laughs> if you're going to follow Christ, there's no way you can escape that label, uh, no matter what you do. If you have any disagreement at all, you are homophobic, and you're spewing hate. Now on the opposing side, we don't know this to be true. We've seen real hate speech, haven't we? If you've watched the news uh, at all over several years, you've come across Fred Phelps, you've come across Westboro Baptist and their ilk, right, that will protest funerals of homosexuals, protest um, guys in the military coming back from battle, protest them at the airports with all manner of hate. We've seen that to be true. However, much of the hostile speech, much of the hatred actually comes from those in the homosexual agenda. It's a ridiculous double standard. Listen to this example. Mike Brown received this after being on TV and talking about homosexuality on TV. A person writes in, I heard you on the Tom Hartman show. I feel sorry for you. You are a horrendous, arrogant bigot. Jesus said, judge ye not, lest ye be judged. You ever heard that before? You're playing God and judging gay people when you should leave that all up to God. Someday soon, all the hateful, homophobic bigots like you will shuffle off this mortal soil, just like all the racist bigots before you, and leave the rest of us more tolerant and loving people to march forward into a wonderful future. Do you have any sense of the double standard there? <laughs> Calls Michael, Mike Brown uh, bigoted and hateful and all those kinds of things for lovingly trying to address the homosexual, basically just disagreeing, and then yet this person hateful, homophobic bigot, arrogant bigot, horrendous, arrogant bigot, <laughs> racist bigot. You need to leave the rest of us tolerant, loving people alone. I was online the other day and I was uh, looking at um, a clip by Matt Chandler. Matt Chandler was, uh, he had a little YouTube clip and he was addressing some part of the uh, homosexual agenda, I don't remember what, and extremely loving extremely um, compassionate in the way that this was his short clip and he was just addressing this issue. And if you just scroll down under the YouTube video and you see the comments that people leave, if, I don't know if you know, uh, Matt uh, suffers from cancer. Uh, they found cancer apparently in his brain. And so as Matt's preaching, he's got this large scar, head almost shaved, large scar that runs down the, you know, across his head like this. Well, the comment at the bottom, some just hateful comments against Matt. Finally, one guy at the bottom says, I should have been praying all along that cancer would have killed you years ago. You should die, you blankety, blankety, blank, right? Hostility. It's a double standard. One YouTube of a video of an older woman giving her testimony of having been saved from her homosexuality. This is a clip of a woman having been saved out of homosexuality, saved from her sin, not in her sin, in which she just simply gave her testimony. She just gave a short testimony. She wasn't advocating against this, that, or the other thing. And she just gave her testimony. Listen to this. These are the comments at the bottom of the video. The relentless idiocy and moral contamination of the anti-gay brigade cannot be denied. One comment. Next comment. Such an ignorant, boneheaded bigot. Funny how the Bible God became so blankety-blank off with the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their supposed sexual immorality that he had them destroyed. 
Yet the same God is perfectly happy to stand by and watch whenever innocent children are sexually abused or murdered. By the way, as we'll see in a later session, uh, a large percentage of that sexual abuse among children happen with homosexuals. The world would be a far nicer place without these Bible-worshipping Neanderthals. Another comment down. I hope they realize that they are reading from a book that was written by a homophobic, sexist, stupid, idiot men thousands of years ago. So where's all the hostility coming from? You know? All part of the natural and wicked inclinations of sinful people who want to call evil good and good evil. So let's look at scripture with respect to this. Are you ready for a breath of fresh air? <laughs> I love the word of God. Just clean, pure water, breath of fresh air. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes, who say, let him be quick, let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near. Let him come that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Now Isaiah's name, this is Isaiah chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Isaiah's name means salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. Isaiah served the Lord for about 60 years through four kings and into the reign of another king, Manasseh, at the end of his service of the Lord. 60-year ministry. Contained within the first section of the book of Isaiah, are warnings about the judgment that is going to come to Judah. The second half of the book is encouragement. But Judah began facing opposition. They faced opposition from Syria, and they faced opposition from Israel. And so when Assyria rose to power, Israel and Syria formed an alliance. Israel and Syria formed an alliance to go against Assyria, to fight against Assyria. They asked Judah... To join in. Now this time Isaiah was serving under King Ahaz and Ahaz refused to help Israel and Syria against Assyria, right? So when Judah refused, Syria and Israel came against Judah. Judah tried to form an unbiblical alliance with Assyria to fight against them, the old twisted web, right? So later, under King Hezekiah, the Assyrians under Sennacherib would invade Judah and attempt to take Jerusalem. Isaiah later prophesies about Judah's defeat to what would be eventually the Babylonians, right? But here they formed this unbiblical alliance, this unhealthy unbiblical alliance with Assyria. And so, because of the nation's idolatry that now was a part of their worship because of their alliance with Assyria— because of their lack of trust in God, because of the unbiblical alliance, and because of their moral depravity, Isaiah, with God's word on his lips, pronounces woes against Judah. And these are called woe oracles. Woe oracles. A good way to think of woe, we've heard before, is wrath of Elohim. You know, W-O-E, a wrath of God coming upon the people. And there's going to be mourning because of the approach of certain judgment, definite judgment that's going to take place. At this time, because of the woe oracles, uh, if you were mourning this, as Isaiah certainly was, there were those that would weep, weeping, they'd shave their heads, dust on their heads, they'd wear sackcloth, uh, they would bring in, as they did, professional wailers. This was serious business. And you can imagine Isaiah weeping over the country as he's preaching these words to them, seeing the coming destruction going to be an attack by Assyria. It's going to go undone, uncompleted, so to speak, and Israel would eventually be overtaken by the Babylonians, and many carted off to exile. So in verse 18, he says this, Isaiah to the people, with an, a woe oracle. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes. And all this, this we see the homosexual agenda we see what's happening. Isaiah pronounces woe or mourning on those who intentionally and purposefully attach themselves to sin, right? They attach themselves to sin. And the way that they're doing that is with cords of falsehood. What that means is they're attaching themselves to that sin with lies, with deception. I am carting this sin along because I want to for these reasons, and they're doing that in lies. Homosexuality is normal. 
What can be more normal than two people loving one another? Aren't we to love our neighbor? Isn't that part of God's intention? How could this be wrong when I love him, love her? Attach themselves with lies. There's nothing wrong with homosexuality. It is just as normal as heterosexuality. Besides, I was born this way. If God made me this way, then how can God condemn homosexuality? Cords of falsehood, right? Cords of lies, deception. Uh, the picture here that's given is one of an animal pulling a cart with ropes. So you've got their big red wagon of, of wickedness, right? Their iniquity behind them. Big red wagon of homosexuality, right? That now they're pulling along with cords of lies, cords of deception. They don't reject it. In fact, they're proud of it. They're happy to be lashed to it, happy for the cords, happy to take them, and happy to be dragging that sin with them. The lies, you understand, we know this from the rest of Scripture also, are deceitful. The lies they tell themselves are deceitful because it, it puts people in bondage to the wagon. It's the deception, the lies they tell themselves that puts them in bondage to their sin. Same works in any circumstance, not just homosexuality. If you are committing a sin, committing a sin, committing a sin, committing a sin, you're in a pattern of sin and you're trying to justify to yourself why that is right. You are attaching yourself by cords of deceit, cords of falsehood to that sin, eventually you're going to sear your conscience, you're going to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, and you're going to be only too happy to be lashed to that cart, dragging along behind you, thinking that you're right with God. Let's say any number of sins. You get angry all the time, angry all the time. Anger, anger, anger. You, well, you know, I'm Irish. It's the way God made me. <laughs> you convince yourself, well, it's, it's okay. You know, it's not that bad. I just got angry. Besides, I ask for forgiveness. It's all right, you know. Or lust. And you're just trapped in lust. Are, are Christians going to struggle with sin? Yes. Are they going to struggle with sin for a lifetime? Yes, they are. But Christians aren't going to be enslaved bitterly to that in such a way that they are okay with it. And yet here, they are content with dragging along that wagon of wickedness, being lied and lied to and deceived in their sin. That which has attached them to their sin or in their bondage to lust or the lies they tell themselves and others. We see that from the homosexual agenda. One of the biggest deceptions we'll talk about later on this afternoon is the deception that I was born this way. God made me this way. What we do in the privacy of our own homes is our business. Lie, deception. Homosexual, homosexuality doesn't harm anyone massive lie. It is just as perfectly acceptable for us to have children as it is for anyone else to have children. Monstrous lie. Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Lie, lie, lie. You ever get this? You've worn any polyester lately? <laughs> You've been eating any shellfish lately? You know, pointing to what they perceive as inconsistencies in God's word deceptions, deceptions that they tell themselves so they can be happy carrying around their wagon of wickedness. You have to recognize the process. Nothing more here than self-justification. As Hebrews chapter 10 says, we can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's why I think that you generally see such hostility from homosexuals. They've been justifying their sin for so long They've been so hardened, their conscience has been so seared, and so they lash out whenever you poke at their defense mechanisms, when you poke at their defensive walls. So the perverted attachment to the sin causes them in pride then to make absurd judgments about God, about his word and his judgment. Verse 19, mocking, right? These are scoffers. They mock in verse 19. They say, let him be quick. Let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. Wow. That is brazen mockery of God's judgment, his coming judgment. They become, in a sense, practical atheists. They believe in God, but they will not believe what he has to say about their sin. They won't live according to his word and they willfully reject that judgment is coming. We see that in the New Testament, don't we, from the words of Peter. Right, Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 3, scoffers will come in the last days. Those days are here. Those scoffers are here. 
Scoffers will come in the last days scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Is that not what we see the, the agenda doing? They're scoffing, they're following their own sinful desires. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. By the same word, the heavens and earth that now existed, that now exist, are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. These are scoffers. Homosexuals in this agenda are practical atheists. They, they mock God in a very prideful sarcasm. That verse 19 is sarcastic, right? And they say, let his judgment come. Let his judgment come now so that we can see it. In other words, if you're true, if you're real, then let it come now. Peter says they, Peter says they ignore the fact of the flood. But they also ignore other signs too, don't they? They ignore AIDS. They ignore other STDs that are in the vast majority of cases caused by a person's lifestyle, in particular a homosexual lifestyle. According to a University of Chicago study, due to promiscuity that is common among sodomites, 55.1% of Chicago's homosexual population had at least one sexually transmitted disease. Over half had at least one STD. According to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, there are alarming rates of intestinal parasitism for homosexual men and disproportionate cases of hepatitis A, hepatitis B. 75%, now, the percentage of homosexuality among the population, like we said, anywhere from 2% upwards of 3 uh, most recent number that I saw from the CDC was 3.8%, uh, identifies themselves as LGB or T, okay? Of that community, let's say 3%, 2%, 75% of all, all of the syphilis cases that are reported in the United States, 75% of them involve homosexual men. A grossly disproportionate, right? According to a 2005 study by the Canadian government, violence was two times as likely among homosexual couples as it was among heterosexual couples. Violence twice as likely among homosexual couples. list goes on and on. All of that, including the flood, should point to the glaring effects, judgment of God, on the lifestyle, on immorality. But they, they don't seem to care. They're pridefully scoffing in verse 19. You know, Ecclesiastes verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 11, the Bible says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. And yet, all of that judgment, all of those effects of sin, and they simply will not acknowledge God. It reminds you of Revelation, doesn't it? When God is pouring out judgment by the bowlfuls on this earth, and yet there are those who refuse to repent. They just blaspheme God. Instead of mourning over their sin and repenting, turning back to God, they actually taunt God in verse 19. Well, their position has to be justified in some way, and so that's where we get to verse 20. Woe to those, Isaiah says, who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Once it's determined that God's word must be wrong or that it doesn't apply, then God's standards can be reinterpreted, they can be challenged, or they can be done away with altogether. And that's what we see the movement doing. His good word is reinterpreted as something evil, Again, we're inconsistent because we don't keep those laws about shellfish and polyester. His word is antiquated. His word is out of date. It doesn't apply today. Besides, Paul was obviously a chauvinistic bigot. It's a miraculous blindness. Without God's inviolable word, when that absolute truth is abandoned, then fallen human reasoning, right? Fallen human desire, fallen human passions, fallen human emotions can rationalize and justify almost anything to make their sin or their sinful action lifestyle acceptable. So as we see in verse 20, good and evil. Light turns to darkness. Sweet turns to bitter. All become relative. 
And it's all become, becomes relative because of the selfish indulgences, the selfish whims of sinful people, the desires of the person. They're all redefined to satisfy the sinful desires of depraved man. Examples of that are what we've mentioned. It's sin to kill someone with cancer, and so we'll twist it, call it euthanasia, make it a merciful and good act. It's wicked sin to kill a child, and yet we'll twist that to be a righteous upholding of the rights of the mother over her own body, right? So sodomy, homosexuality, will twist, pervert the word of God, corrupt the word of God to twist it into something that is good. Besides, we were born that way. It's a matter of civil rights. Just because they re redefine it, it doesn't mean that they lessen not one mite the authority of God over that circumstance or the relevancy of God's word. And it doesn't delay God's judgment. God's judgment already here in many ways. We'll talk about that later this afternoon as we take a look at Romans 1 together. Uh, but certainly it doesn't delay God's judgment, complete judgment, full and final judgment. doesn't delay it one bit. Verse 21, woe, wrath of God, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Woe is mourning and lamentation at the coming of judgment over the cause of this wicked abandonment of God's word. The cause of all this is that people do what they want to do and they ignore God's word to do it. They believe that they are the authority. They have the right themselves to say what is good and what is evil. Truth comes from what they think. They can determine that for themselves. No one else can tell them how to live or what to do because they know for themselves what is right. Pride leads them to abandon God's law. Pride makes it so they don't listen. Pride makes them battle for the right to do their evil. And pride makes them think they have the right to redefine it as good. Just an outpouring of the depravity of man, right? Pride ultimately leads them to replace the word of God with such abominations as the Queen James Bible. A well-known lesbian professor and social worker named Barb Burge said this, homosexuality basically is challenging oppressive gender structures and making gender rights a priority. These are critical steps toward universal freedom for them, right? And punishment for gender nonconformity. She urges social workers to challenge gender stereotyping unceasingly. Whatever the forum, we must be capable of sophisticated conversations on gender if we hope to, and listen to this, cure the social diseases of sexism, homophobia, heterosexism, and transphobia, as they define that. In all our communications, we can inject the language of diversity and inclusivity into a gendered world. You combine that notion with the reality of liberal and activist judges, a highly litigious society, the ridiculous costs involved of trying to defend that in the courts, right? and the workplace fear that that causes among most people, and you have a recipe for continued insanity. That's because we have abandoned God's law. They have calling evil good, and then progressing to the, the necessary extent of that, calling good evil. We need the Lord, don't we? We need the Lord. They need the gospel. We need to be faithful to the Lord in sharing the gospel. The hope for all this that we'll discuss in a later session is the gospel, is our Lord Jesus Christ, is God's word. We need God's help to do it, and we just need to pray. We are dependent upon the Lord for everything, aren't we? And the faithful, righteous prayer of a righteous man avails much. We need to pray to the Lord for help in this. Um, we need to trust the Lord. The Lord knows what he's doing. The Lord is sovereign. Um, but we as Christians, let's just be faithful to him and then trust him with the results. All right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that you are sovereign. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't just set the world off spinning and then now stand afar off to see how it all turns out. We thank you, Lord, that you are close or that you are in our hearts, in our minds. As the Bible says, in our mouths, that we may know you, that we may stand 
for you, that we may fervently live for you, that we may trust you and depend upon you, or that we may wage a, a holy war, as Paul says to Timothy, wage good and righteous warfare for you, uh, taking a stand for your truth as holy, just, and good, for your law as holy, just, and good, and not just good for us, but good for everyone, because it is holy, just, and good. We praise you, Lord, for the instruction that your word provides. Praise you, and Lord, praise you, Lord, for the, the power and the strength that your spirit supplies, the illumination that your spirit supplies, the understanding. We pray, Lord, that we as your people would be faithful to live for you, faithful to preach your gospel so that lost people can be saved. Lord, and just, I know with my brothers and sisters, look forward to that day when we can be free from this wickedness around us, Lord, but that we can be fully and finally free from our own flesh. We can worship you in purity and truth and holiness for all of eternity, for your glory, and it's for our good. We know that, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.